Um, so my name is Cara Jones and I work for an organisation called Archaeology Scotland. Um, we're based just outside of Edinburgh but we work throughout Scotland from Shetland down, down to Dumfries and Galloway. We're a membership organisation um, and we have a variety of roles um, but we primarily act as an approachable centre for knowledge and expertise in Scottish archaeology. We have three key aims, um, education, promotion and support. And one of the um, schemes that we deliver those three aims is the Dr. Monument Project, which is what I work on. So with Adopt a Monument, um, we encourage and facilitate the needs of communities who wish to take a leading role in conserving um, and promoting their local heritage. The scheme's been running on and off for about 20 years, but we relaunched it again last year, um, and we're here for five years, so we finished in 2016. We're currently working with 18 groups, but we've got another 47 groups on our waiting list, so there's a real keen interest to get involved. Um, so you can see some of the key things that we sort of helped with um, with King's Group when they approached us. Um, but I think the most important thing about our scheme really is it's community-led. All the ideas and decisions come from the groups. We just help when and where they need us with guidance and um, training provision and things like that. So, the new scheme is set up um, to continue helping more traditional community archaeology groups, um, but we're also set up to do outreach projects, and that's taking heritage to non-traditional audiences that previously perhaps felt excluded about getting involved with their local heritage. Um, so, to sort of um, make sure this phase of uh, Dr. Monument is open to all, we've reassessed our project delivery uh, methodology. We've looked at easier ways to maybe get um, different audiences involved. And you can see um, previously our groups have produced interpretation or disseminated their results through traditional mediums. Um, but you can see from some of these pictures down below, um, some of the issues that arise with these mediums can very quickly become weathered, out of date, they're very costly to replace. Um, grey literature does have a habit of staying hidden unless you know where to find it. And paper leaflets can cost a lot to get reprinted for a small group if, you know, if they don't have any funding. So we feel that this new phase of the project brings the opportunity to utilise advances in new media and new technology to sort of mitigate against some of these issues and perhaps also um, uh, bring in new audiences. So how are we promoting digital engagement? We really have sort of four main ways really. And that's sort of social media, it's through our training workshops, it's through online resources and also utilisation of digital products. So firstly talking about um, social media, it's come up a lot over the last few days. Um, so many people ask us why don't we have our own Dr Monument Facebook page. <coughs> um, and we've decided not to, we've decided to instead utilise our main um, Archaeology Scotland um, Facebook page, um, it already has over 3,000 likes, so we didn't have to build an audience in that way. I know we've talked about how audience likes and you know, make what be representative of how people are engaging with you, but it did mean we didn't have to build, um, build that interest in that way. Um, the other advantage of using our main corporate accounts is that all of Archaeology Scotland's various projects um, update that Facebook page, so it's not just down to us to make sure con the content is constantly uploaded and that presence is constantly maintained. But one example um, where it hasn't worked for us, um, at the start we, talk we talked about maybe setting up individual project pages on Facebook for some of our projects. And you can see the far page over there, that's um, our Minding Merkinch um, outreach project, and you can see it's so successful it's got 12 likes. Um, so, <laughs> this is one example. This was an outreach project based up in Inverness, and it was to work with a local community to help them um, research and engage with their local heritage. Um, we had hoped to attract um, young members of that local community, and therefore we set up that separate Facebook page, because we felt it would be a good way to engage with that sort of youth element. Um, but two factors really contributed, I think, to this not succeeding. <coughs> Um, one was the fact that the, the local youth club was closed due to lack of funding, so we didn't have a sort of um, galvanised group that we could access, and individually the, the young people were not, did not want to come along to learn about the HR, unfortunately. Um, but as a, as a result, the demographic of our participants um, didn't really interact with Facebook. They received their information by email, phone, or local posters. And the other thing is we found as well, we didn't have time to constantly 
um, upload things onto that Facebook account. I mean, it could have been an opportunity to develop a sort of um, remote interest site about Merkinch, but we just didn't have time to maintain that. Um, so, I mean, I think that's, that's a really important thing, and it was an important lesson we've learned right at the start, is to make sure you have enough time and resource to, to maintain these sorts of, these sorts of um, accounts. We do have um, a Twitter account. Again, we're still sort of working on that. I think we have just over about 300 followers. We could be a bit more active on it. We should, we should really tweet a bit more on it. Um, but it has resulted in quite a few inquiries about the scheme from other, other public archaeology practitioners. It's allowed us to contact potential partners for projects. Um, the Sporting Memories project is going to work with us next year on an outreach project. And we contacted them through Twitter. Has any of the, like the Twitter account or Facebook, has it, um, has it sort of resulted in new groups? Probably not. But it's a really nice way, it's a different way for us to disseminate results or news quickly for people that don't engage with our website. Um, one thing as well that came out of this summer was that one of our project participants started posting um, video diaries of um, information he'd learnt during a workshop that we, we ran um, on the West Coast. Um, and I think it worked really well. He did it on his mobile phone. And it was just lovely to see the information he retained from the workshop and then create that narrative of the landscape as he saw it. And that's really nice. Um, and in February, I'm starting a new outreach project um, where I'm hoping to utilise WordPress and possibly Vimeo. We've seen participant narrative come out um, in projects such as Project Florence, the Thames Discovery Programme. And also this week, I noticed Caddo Archaeology had their participant voice coming out in their Facebook account as well. And I think it's a really nice way to get different voices from these projects out into the open. So we're also delivering um, <coughs> sort of workshops. Um, you know, we see sort of, we're, we're advocating digital interpretation and digital products, and we see this as a sort of sustainable and economic way to engage, you know, to produce engaging products. But we recognise that if we're encouraging participants to engage digitally, we need to give them training to do this. We'd really like some of our groups to become digitally independent from us, and we are going to try and achieve this by training and through utilisation of open source software. There's no point like teaching groups how to use Arc, Arc GIS if in four years' time we leave and take our licence with us. So we're trying to advocate that sort of um, utilisation of open source software. So we've had um, a training workshop on the Isle of Mole where we used um, it was Microsoft um, Photosynth and another open source um, software, I can't remember exactly what it was, but these participants over the weekend, they learned how to sort of record objects digitally and then process the data on the laptops. And we also recognise that if we're advocating all this digital greatness, um, we need to train ourselves to do it. So we're also um, sort of doing training courses ourselves to be able to be accurate to the information that we're, we're giving out. Um, we're really highlighting um, online resources for our groups. Um, we're in a unique position, I think, in Scotland because there's a wealth of online data. Um, the National Library have the most amazing collection of digital maps on their website. And there's a few great um, local HERs. The Highland HER is brilliant, but I used to work there. Um, <laughs> so, um, and again, uh, returning to the Minding Mark Inch project, we encourage participants to sort of do their research of their local area by logging on, on to, you know, online onto the Highland HER, um, by going to libraries, by going to service points so they didn't have access to computers themselves. Um, and we're also internally, we're trying to put any resources that we produce, um, such as newsletters or training guides, we're digitising them and putting them on our website though, so people can download them for free. So the other thing, um, we're also, sort of, as I say, advocating utilisation of digital projects through digital interpretation. Um, one, one group that's um, hot off the mark is um, it's our Heights of Fodity Adopter Monument project. And they've linked their site into a local heritage app um, called the Strathpeffer In Initiative Heritage App. And that got launched, I think, a couple of months ago. Um, so our Adopter Monument site forms a trail of six sites um, around the Strathpeffer region. Um, it's quite interesting, the app is complemented by the paper leaflets. And also the, um, the group have also fundraised to get handheld devices um, in a, into a local cafe so people can go in and hire the handheld devices if they don't have uh, smartphones or tablets themselves to go around and, and enjoy the app. 
Um, another one of our examples, Malkayach, um, I talked about this one in May, but the this group are really keen to sort of, um, they don't want intrusive interpretation, they don't want big panels everywhere on this site, it's a lovely, peaceful site with wide-reaching views. So instead, um, they want to provide interpretation, but they don't want intrusive interpretation, so instead we're going to put, I think, selective QR codes in and around the site, they're a bit less intrusive, and then people can choose to engage with interpretation rather than perhaps being forced on it. One thing I think that's um, arisen that quite unexpectedly I think is, I mean we're advocating um, groups to use sort of things like Maker Mapper um, and that's where you can like upload for free sort of um, maps that you've created or maps that you're interested in or things like that so you can create your content and upload it for free. Um, we, we were involved in a project where we had a working partner and um, we were going to, with the results of that project, we were going to create an app using Make a Mapper. Um, and I think they were very concerned about corporate image. Because we're a community-led scheme, we, we like to be obviously acknowledged if we've worked with a, with a project, but we're a bit less concerned um, for the app to be decked out in sort of our corporate um, colours. But our partners on this one, um, their corporate identity and their brand awareness was really important to how they raise money. Um, they could, felt they couldn't be involved in, a, in producing a product like that that just only had maybe their, their name. They didn't have any of their sort of recognised uh, brand awareness. <coughs> so that's, that's something really interesting, something we didn't expect and we'll have to think about how we do that in the future. So I've talked a little bit about the sort of digital engagement in our outreach projects. Um, but to really like, summarise this part of the Doctor Monument, um, we, see it, we see digital technology as a great hook to get people involved in archaeology. Some of our projects, um, they, they've said archaeology is not for me, or heritage is not for me, oh, but if I get to use a computer for two hours a week, then I'll come along and join in, so subtly sneaking heritage into their lives. Um, and we also see it as a way for some of our participants to develop key transferable skills that they can then take on and use elsewhere in their lives. So I've got um, obviously plans and benefits there. That's quite a long slide. I think like um, perhaps you can look when Doug uploads it, you can look at that um, a bit more in depthly. But we have we have got some long term plans and we're quite excited about well we like what we do. So. <laughs> but. Um, I just wanted to mention as well that we do have barriers to our grand plans. Um, as Lorna mentioned, it's lovely to get a plug from the Lorna Richardson. Um, 3G reception in Scotland is very limited and it's centred around big population areas. A lot of our sites are in rural areas. Um, Scottish Government has an infrastructure plan, so hopefully that will begin to improve. We all know that you can use apps in remote areas, providing you download them before you go and access your GPS. Um, and I also heard recently that I think um, another uh, natural heritage organisation up in Scotland are exp experimenting with pop-up 3G enhancers in rural areas. So I'm going to start researching that because that sounds fantastic. Um, so I suppose, I mean really, I'm not here to tell you anything new. Um, I just really wanted to conclude that I feel though we are, a Dr. Mommy is in a way, it's in a unique um, position in that we're here for five years we aim to complete as a minimum 55 projects and I think this is a real opportunity to experiment what sort of digital engagement really works and what doesn't. Thank you.